Welcome to the Potter Blog site. It is Monday, February 21st, 2012. Uh, this evening's video subject is uh, coronal mass ejections and how to identify the ones that uh, would be likely to take out the grid here in the United States uh, with the potential end result being the meltdown of 71 nuclear reactors causing basically 71 type Fukushima's in the United States. Uh, what we're talking about here is uh, identifying those type of coronal mass ejections uh, that would be most likely to induce this, uh, what to look for, how to cost effective things one can do to prepare, how not to be overly concerned on just any particular coronal mass ejection. But we first covered parts of this subject in uh, May of 2011 where we looked at some uh, previous studies on grid collapse from uh, a 1921 size solar storm. It's from the year 1921. Uh, these studies were done before Fukushima. Interestingly, they never mention nuclear reactors uh, melting down. They also don't usually mention the effects on the natural gas pipelines and the fuel pipelines that would occur from a coronal mass ejection. Now, one thing I have heard people discuss is uh, when they talk about these solar storms causing uh, uh, EMP-like event is that they they misconstrue the EMP event from a, a high-altitude nuclear explosion versus the EMP that would come from a uh, typically would come from a solar storm, and they break down into two simple differences. There's two components to a uh, EMP caused by a nuke. Uh, one is the component caused by the radiation itself. Uh, from the explosion and then the second part of that is a local shift in the magnetic field. Uh, a coronal mass injection, ejection on the other hand, typically doesn't have the radiation effects from high, high atomic weight fallout instantaneously occurring. But it does have a large shift in the uh, Earth's magnetic field. Now the key difference between those two are is that uh, if a nuke goes off overhead at some distance in which you can survive it, then uh, the EMP from that nuke could fry computers, car ignitions, anything electronic, even if it's not plugged in or turned on. Whereas typically the uh, magnetic pulse from a coronal mass ejection will only induce currents in long transmission lines, long pipelines, long conductors. It uh, won't typically fry your computer if it's turned off and not plugged in, but uh, it will cause current voltage spikes, uh, whatever, in the grid. Now, the risk here is, is that uh, these sections here, from a 1921, from an event similar to the one that occurred in 1921, which wasn't the strongest of all that have occurred. The, the largest recorded one was a solar coronal mass ejection event recorded was in 1859. That's called a Carrington, it was called the Carrington event. This is a smaller event than that one. This one occurred in 1921. Were it to occur today, uh, these areas here encircled in red have uh, basically have some uh, large electrical transformers that would fail from uh, this type of coronal mass ejection. And those large electrical transformers are no longer made in this country. It takes a long time to make them and they have a long back order. So a coronal mass ejection that would take these guys out would take out these uh, large scale transformers Basically, it would take years to replace all of these and get the system back up. Um, the red circles are common to those areas where these type of large uh, electrical transformers are in use and would have a susceptibility. Now, a larger 1859 storm would have a uh, potentially a broader uh, range. But uh, the key here is, our, and the key is, should such an event occur, and they, these 1921 size events seem to occur roughly around every 75 years, but they're not uh, 
completely random. They, they occur in cycles uh, based on solar activity. Uh, we're in such an, we're in a increased period of solar activity now and probably for the next two years where the likelihood of this event increases. Now, you know, some people I believe probably panic and run to the wind or are frightened every time a uh, coronal mass ejection is listed in the news or something comes out and then nothing happens. You know, sort of like uh, there are states in this country where they'll set off a tornado siren uh, for any funny looking cloud. Then there are other states in this country, usually down the south, where uh, the tornado sirens uh, don't go off until at least one porch has collapsed and seven dogs have died. So the key here is, is to identify those type of scenarios which would avail oneself to being aware of the situation. Now at minimum, if there's an inbound coronal mass ejection, it would be very wise to have a tank full of gas in your car. Because if the electricity goes out, yeah, the gas stations go out. There's no pumping of gas at that point. Now, the concern here is, is this is an extremely large scale event that potentially could be damaging for years. Now, so when does one act? Uh, when does one react? When does one shelter in place? When does one leave? Well, it's all based on information. You know, if these uh, events do occur, one thing you could be certain of is that when any sort of communication is reestablished from the authorities, and that could be within hours to days, uh, the command given or the direction given will be shelter in place. People will generally not be evacuated. And the reason for this is if you can imagine a million people trying to live, leave a city, each of them with uh, half a tank full of gas at maximum, where are they going to go? And considering that they're going to be out of power for potentially years, it's best to shelter in place. Now, there's some wiggle room in that for an individual. You know, for the herd, the, the lowest losses from the herd are if you tell the herd to shelter in place. Uh, the lowest losses for any individual human is when you have good information and you can react before the herd stampedes and does something stupid. So uh, the key bits of information have are, especially in the event of a, uh, these uh, reactors uh, melting down with regard to this type of event, is, uh, is there unusual radiation present? And that means if you're concerned about this sort of activity and you want to prepare, you have to have some sort of Geiger counter because you're not going to have the internet to look up at within a reasonable time frame to make any decision. So it'd be wise to have a Geiger counter, any kind of Geiger counter that, that works. If you're a ham radio operator, it would be best to have a really good Geiger counter so you can have some good information you can pass out. Uh, we typically recommend the uh, inspector alert over here, but uh, I'd search around. Best prices we've found have been here on Amazon on the inspector, but uh, search around. Find what you can find. Uh, the other thing to look for is, is likely the initial most trustworthy forms of communication will come from uh, ham radio operators. So if you have a, a way of listening to the ham radio operators, that would be good also. Now the key is, if you can imagine here, the grid collapsing, power being out, and uh, potentially water's out too, water and food. So somewhere between zero and three days you know, the reactors start to melt down between day two and day three if there's no water people start getting antsy and by day seven there's no food left so at which day do people start to react and uh, try to leave the area now if there's if they're aware of the radiation then that might even cause greater concern so you're likely not to be told if these things occur, that they are occurring, and that's for the safety of the, the herd. Uh, in that regard, it also would be wise to have some of these uh, Iostat uh, potassium iodide tablets. Now, we do recommend purchasing those directly from uh, Amazon, and specifically from, from fulfillment by Amazon, because we believe there's some... Uh, potential out there that these uh, 
type of Iosat thyroid blocker pills are, have been uh, faked. You know, that there's fraud in the production of these. So it's best to uh, use, uh, you know, people are making counterfeits, we suspect, especially over in Japan. So going through somebody reputable like Amazon is the best deal. Uh, they're relatively cheap. They run from between five and ten dollars uh, for a single pack. Single pack will last an adult two weeks and a uh, child uh, four weeks. So, of course, now obviously one does not want to freak out at every coronal mass ejection that occurs. So, what do we look for? Well, well before we say that, one thing I'd like to add in here is that um, the power companies utility operators are aware of this and they watch the uh, projections and they react to the projections from uh, coronal mass ejections and they try to provide stability and keep the system up that's why we don't have massive grid collapse every time one hits us it has to be the stronger ones or it has to be an unusual one that they're not looking for now the greatest times of vulnerability from a just from a blackout perspective on a low strength storm is in fall and spring in low usage hours which is around midnight and the reason for that is is there's less excess capacity available during those hours should a generator go down for the utility operators to bring up another generator to help stabilize the grid so you could have one or two generation stations go down but have a blackout that covers a large area because there's no available excess during those times to bring it back up. And in some ways that's a better situation because uh, the majority of that blackout can be righted relatively quickly, one, you know, two or three days max, uh, because they can bring up uh, other generating stations. Now, the most dangerous time period of all is uh, summer or winter during the high load hours more so summer uh, because of the temperature on the transformers and because of the uh, the loads uh, the, the grid is at the least stable and most uh, susceptible to fault when it's at the most greatly loaded and if that occurs then in a strong solar storm those blackouts will not be as readily recoverable and you would have a situation similar to these listed here when we have the uh, 71 uh, nuclear reactors that could melt down in a uh, usually in a three-day time period some as little as four hours depending on how badly they are hit now one thing we did mention earlier is the difference between a nuclear explosion in the atmosphere causing an EMP and a coronal mass ejection uh, causing a uh, ground currents. Post Fukushima there is another aspect to this and that is there is now high atomic weight fallout both radioactive and non-radioactive in the upper atmosphere and it is possible for the CME, the proton events, to cause nuclear interactions on a distributed level in the upper atmosphere akin to one one might expect from a a discrete point explosion of a nuke in the atmosphere. So there is some possibility from this high Fukushima fallout that a large enough coronal mass ejection could induce failures in items like computers and cars that are not turned on or not plugged in to outlets. Basically a, uh, a almost a, a nuclear explosion type of uh, damage to uh, electronics so if there's a uh, if you see the northern lights overhead and you're living somewhere down south and at the same time you your car and your neighbor's car won't start that's really really bad news at that time the potter blog team would be taking our iodine pills because that uh, that same fallout that's in the upper atmosphere radioactive and non-radioactive such event were to occur, that fallout would also spall into uh, iodine. But for those of you who've hung on so long, and we try to keep this short, and there is a world of things we can cover in here. 
But uh, let me show you the most concerning uh, situation to be aware of that the power companies might not look for and that could cause potentially the most damage in a coronal mass ejection uh, event. And that is, let's pull this up. Let's, hopefully we don't have to restart it. There we go. Now what we've done here is create a quick animation showing two coronal mass ejections. An initial one and a second one and they impact Earth almost simultaneously. Now, some theorize this is what happened in 1859 and why that event known as the Carrington event was uh, of such magnitude that there was actually two coronal mass ejections and that they the second one was faster approaching than the first one and that they both impacted around the same time. That is the key event to look for in a uh, situation where at, uh, others might not realize the risk and danger. And that is if you see two coronal mass ejections, earth directed, full halo, and they're separated by a short time period, you know, maybe as much as a day, that uh, they could both simultaneously impact and cause a, a world of hurt like in 1859. And were that to happen, then you know, literally the grid could be down for for years. Now some places like Texas and Florida might have lesser problems but uh, even if you're in one of those places where you've got your own grid uh, what's going to happen is is that eventually they're going to take whatever transformers you have and ship them to the places that are most damaged with the highest population elements. So, you know, one could live in fear of all these things, but uh, generally we don't believe that's the case. You know, the, the rarity of the event you see here is approximately estimated to be once every 500 years on average. Um, the rarity of an event that could cause this is once every 75 years. And again, this was a 1921 size event. So, if you're concerned about these coronal mass ejections causing this type of damage, and you, know, you don't want to get uh, shell shock from every report of a flare, you know, the wise thing to do is to have a full tank of gas, uh, be able to uh, make your own determinations if there's a radioactive fallout in your area, and then have a plan and a methodology to understand when you should uh, evacuate where you would go and being able to do so before the rest of the herd understands what the risk is. So it's a troubling scenario and there's really not much one can do to prepare for years long blackout but I mean, we believe that most people are generally good and so recovery would occur but uh, you know there's always evil and people who try to uh, take advantage in evil manner you know for example those of you aware what happened in Sarajevo in the 80s or uh, what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto in World War II or even in uh, Stalingrad or St. Petersburg as we prefer to call it in uh, World War II but uh, these are troubling events, but we don't lose sleep over them. The key is, is to be able to make quick initial decisions that place you ahead of the herd, at least for a week or two weeks, and then hopefully some semblance of stability returns, and even though life is tough, people can get on with what they need to do. Now, of course, if it's uh, full-blown 71 Fukushima's, you know, Best thing to do there is pray. <laughs>